Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Keith Whalen. I'm with RPI Consultants. I want to once again thank you for taking the time to join us for this webinar on advanced technical differences with Lawson 10X. With us today, we have three really great presenters. We have Mr. Richard Stout, Mr. Carl C., Mr. Chip Cunningham, all flying in from sunny Florida to deliver this today. Uh, before I hand it over, I have a couple of housekeeping notes. One is we will be recording this presentation, and we will make that link available to you uh, that you can share on our website in a week or so. Uh, number two is there should be a live uh, video feed of the presenters of this presentation, and you should be able to toggle that window with the presentation to make each bigger or smaller as you desire on your screen. And number three, all attendees are on listen-only mode. Uh, we do welcome questions uh, throughout the presentation. Please type them into the GoToMeeting module chat or question boxes, and our kind host, Ms. Brittany Degler, will ask them as she has the opportunity. And with that, I give you our presenters. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for uh, joining me on uh, for this Lawson 10X technical Q&A presentation. I see it a, a click in the PowerPoint so my remote will work. Um, I have, um, uh, let's talk about uh, RPI consultants for uh, a little bit. If you've been with us um, for our earlier presentations today, uh, you, you, you've heard about us. We are 50 plus consultants strong at this point. We have a great technical team uh, based out of our Lakeland, Florida office, and uh, we've 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 had uh, we, uh, we, we've had a lot of experience with uh, loss in ten upgrades over the past year. Uh, so I have, a, I have a lot to share with you guys today. Uh, well, oh, it's just the range, huh? Just your number. Awesome. <laughs> All right, so um, a few topics I want to touch on today, but um, please uh, uh, feel free to, to jump in, use the chat, use the Q&A feature within GoToWebinar, and uh, my, my, my producer, Brittany, will interrupt with uh, questions throughout the presentation. Uh, definitely, you know, I, I, I've talked to a lot of you at, at user groups and, on, and uh, over the phone, um, with, with upgrade planning, uh, definitely want to hear a lot of feedback uh, for what kinds of questions and information you're uh, hungry for. So uh, by all means, please uh, please jump in and interrupt. So um, there we go. Yeah, just, oh yeah? Nice. <laughs> uh, so, why, why do I feel like I can stand up here uh, today and talk about Lost in 10? Because we uh, have been very fortunate to, to have a lot of experience with Lost in 10. Um, uh, dating back a couple of years now, uh, we were involved in four uh, net new implementations and uh, have uh, a, a just a, over a dozen upgrade projects going on with um, uh, two 10x upgrades uh, that we went live with just a couple of months ago. Uh, so let's dive right into it. The what's in and what's out. Uh, we'll start with um, some of the easy stuff. Uh, throw throw a softball. Uh, I think we all have heard that LA, LAUA security is out with uh, loss in 10. So if you have any users still using LUA security classes, of course, um, they, they'll need to transition over to loss of security. LID is out for um, forms, for application access. Um, the uh, user interfaces in Lawson 10 are either Mingle, the web-based interface, or Smart Office. LID still exists for uh, administration. Um, your uh, system utilities still run through LID. And of course, process flow is out. Process flow moves over to IPA, in core process automation, uh, next generation workflow product. Uh, what's in with 10? Uh, I want to call out licensing. Um, everyone on uh, the webinar today, uh, if you haven't done so yet, uh, please get in contact with your in core account executive and start getting licensed for version 10. Um, you know, it's 
even if there's no charge, because uh, you're on support and you're just switching to the newer version, um, there are uh, some license changes that, that happen going to version 10. You'll need the new application decryption key. If you're implementing Landmark for the first time, there's a, a no charge license addendum for that. Uh, if you're moving to uh, Windows Server 2012 R2, um, there is a visual COBOL uh, application that needs to be purchased. What else is in with 10? Um, a lot of people have asked about Design Studio. How does that play uh, in with Mingle? Um, the good news is Design Studio uh, forms uh, do migrate into Lost in 10. They still work in Lost in 10. There are a few changes, uh, and we've, we've had some good experience working through what, uh, what elements require a bit more hands-on. Thank you. What, what, what elements in Design Studio screens require a bit, uh, a, a bit of uh, compatibility remediation and which, which flow pretty well? So uh, do feel free to follow up with an email if you want specifics on that. Um, also in with 10, Enforce Security Services becomes a, a pretty big part of the uh, security platform. It's responsible for federation between Lawson and Landmark, and we'll touch on that a little bit later in the presentation. Let's see the next slide. Okay, talk a little bit about platforms. I'm trying to move quick so we get it all, but do feel free to interrupt with questions. Um, I think the, the most, we've seen a lot of interest in uh, Windows Server 2012 R2 uh, as far as the, the platform for Lawson 10. Um, uh, we have a lot of customers going there. Uh, it opened, uh, this version of Windows became supported with LSF 1007, which just dropped a, a couple of months ago, uh, and, and uh, it's by far the most popular platform for uh, our upgrades uh, that we have going on. A um, couple of changes um, with Windows Server 2012 R2. Uh, Microsoft um, has phased out SUA, the subsystem for Unix applications. So the Unix compatibility layer is provided by SIGWIN, uh, so it's a little bit different than um, Windows 2008. Also, uh, I think the biggest change is the change in the COBOL compiler. Uh, Microfocus switched up their product lines. Uh, NetExpress only works through uh, Windows 2008 or 2. With the newer version of Windows, there's a, there's a different COBOL uh, runtime application, and that's called Visual COBOL. And uh, the bad news is that is not a free upgrade. Uh, you will need to purchase Visual COBOL um, to, to, to run Lawson on Windows Server 2012 R2. Uh, that, that purchase is made from Microfocus, but your Infor AE can help facilitate that, help get a quote. Uh, definitely something to start working through uh, now in advance of uh, kicking off your upgrade. Uh, also, just want to touch on um, some other platforms. Of course, IBM iSeries uh, continues to be supported. AIX is our uh, most popular operating system over on the Unix side. Uh, the, uh, AIX um, will be a, uh, a go-forward operating system for, uh, for, for the Infor applications for years to come. Uh, we have support, continue to have support for Solaris and HPUX, although um, those, two, those two operating systems um, will probably phase out in the next version of Lawson. 11. We have um, support for Red Hat Enterprise Linux uh, that is new for uh, Lost in 10. And then, of course, uh, continue to support Windows Server 2008 R2. Um, that, that might be a good choice if you wanted to stay on the Windows platform but did not want to do the Visual COBOL, uh, don't want to pay for that license, you can then uh, stay on Server 2008 R2 with um, your existing COBOL license. Um, all right. Let's take a look at uh, let's take a look at at, at Lawson 10. Uh, if you haven't seen it, here's a screenshot. Um, this is our, our PO20 screen uh, brought to you by Mingle. Um, so you can see the visual styling is is pretty different, but the the functionality of the form pretty much um, remains the same. And um, once you get over the aesthetics, you'll find that uh, it, it works pretty much the same way. So, um, interesting thing about this, uh, this screenshot is it actually shows content from two different servers. Um, 
Mingle is the framework around uh, Lawson. It's 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 the Chrome around Lawson, and it's a maybe a common misconception that uh, Mingle channels all the communication from between Lawson and your the end user's web browser. In fact, um, when you bring up uh, Lawson 10 in uh, Internet Explorer, Chrome, or Firefox, um, your browser is getting content from two different servers, uh, putting them together with frames and, uh, and presenting it as a unified view. Um, the uh, top portion of the page, uh, Mingle, uh, is coming from your Mingle server. That, of course, is running on a Microsoft stack uh, backed by a SQL server. But the middle portion of the page, the loss in form, is still driven by portal. And that content uh, still comes uh, powered by WebSphere. Um, you know, if you're on a, a, a Unix and Oracle backend, um, you know, that, that's what's providing that content. And, and all that comes together um, in frames and browser. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Mingle and um, what, what this server is composed of, what, what are the different components. Um, so Mingle, Mingle only runs on, on Windows. Um, typically, we install uh, Windows Server to, uh, 2012 R2 at this point. It also uh, has a prerequisite requirement of SQL Server. Um, it, you can't use SQL Express. You need to use um, a, an, an actual SQL Server. It's not necessary to dedicate one uh, for Mingle. You can, you can uh, you know, borrow or make use of a, an existing SQL Server instance if you have one available. Uh, when we go to install Mingle, uh, the actual first component that, that we install is uh, Microsoft SharePoint Foundation 2013. Uh, this is a free version of SharePoint uh, available from Microsoft. And that, that provides the... Um, the, uh, the, the, the foundation of the groundwork for the rest of the application. Uh, with SharePoint up and running in uh, IIS, the next step is to install the Infor Mingle uh, Foundation app. Uh, this is the, the Infor product that installs into SharePoint. Um, once you have that up and running, um, at that point you can, you can, you can uh, bring up your Mingle page, uh, of course, when you first navigate into uh, any page on SharePoint, the, by default, SharePoint is going to want to authenticate you before it presents any content. And the way it does that is it brings up a Windows login. Because uh, out of the box, SharePoint uh, integrates with, with Active Directory with uh, a Windows login. And even though our uh, loss environment might be bound to AD, uh, that's not really how we want to uh, that's not really how we want Mingle to work with authentication. We want it to, we want it to single sign on with loss. So in order to do that, uh, Enforce provided a component to replace the built-in security token service that comes with SharePoint um, with, uh, with a piece that ties loss and security, ties back to loss and security. Uh, so the next step after installing Mingle Foundation is we run the dsp.jar install we install LS as SCS, that's loss and security as security token service. Um, I will point out that this is just uh, one of a couple of different options uh, for a single sign-on strategy uh, for the, 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 the loss, in for loss and 10 applications. Um, LS as STS is, is preferred if for an on-premise deployment, uh, if um, you you don't need single sign-on with other non-loss and in four applications. Uh, another option that uh, was more popular uh, a couple of years ago um, is Kerberos. Uh, uh, Kerberos authentication uh, works a bit differently. Um, it's it's definitely more complicated to set up, and uh, we, we would advise uh, going with LSS SCS unless um, unless you have reasons that you need to use Kerberos for single sign-on. Um, a third option is uh, used more commonly with uh, cloud deployments. So uh, Infor Cloud uses ADFS for authentication. Um, that's Active Directory Federation Services uh, to tie Mingle back to single sign-on. Um, so that was a tangent on security. 
but I do want to talk about the final uh, piece of the puzzle up top uh, here with Mingle. Um, once Mingle is installed and you have single sign-on set up back to Lawson, the next step is to integrate your Lawson applications with Mingle. And obviously the most important one is Portal. Uh, in order to do that, we install a piece called the S3 plugin for Mingle. And that's what per basically provides the frame uh, to display portal within uh, Mingle. It's, um, that gives you your, um, in addition to, in addition to just the frame, there's some other, uh, there, there's some other communication that goes on there. You've got, for example, your, um, your uh, print manager widget, you've got uh, communication with contextual apps, uh, all that's powered by our S3 plugin. Each each Lawson web-based application that you have uh, is going to be presented and mingled through a plugin. So if you have LBI, uh, Dashboard Reporting Services, uh, that will be presented through the LBI plugin. Um, and the MSCM web interface comes in through a plugin. Um, we have a custom plugin that's available uh, that will offer a single sign-on and, and integration with uh, basically any other uh, in for Lawson web app, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So what are some best practices for a Mingle deployment? Uh, we definitely recommend uh, ins installing Mingle on a, a fresh Windows virtual machine, and you want one per environment. So if you've got three environments, a uh, dev, a test, and a prod, uh, you want to think about provisioning three new Windows virtual machines for your loss and 10 build, uh, a mingle test, a mingle dev, and a mingle prop. Uh, also, and, and we do recommend um, running mingle on its own uh, Windows VM uh, for performance reasons as well as uh, just keeping all your settings uh, separate and, and preventing any conflict um, you know, with, with other loss and applications. I, I would not recommend running mingle on your loss and application server, uh, for example. Um, also, it, you might have a uh, you might have a, an intranet SharePoint site in the organization. Um, we don't necessarily recommend trying to utilize that for your loss and ten environment. And, and that's I will give you two good reasons um, not to try and borrow an existing SharePoint instance, uh, but but set this up as a standalone server. Uh, one is um, uh, authentication, single sign-on. Uh, typically, your Mingle site is going to single sign on to Lawson. That means anyone who accesses Mingle uh, needs to be a Lawson user. A and that probably uh, uh, doesn't um, make sense for more of a, an intranet portal. Uh, and the other reason is uh, version compatibility. Um, it, I think it's, it's uh, too much to introduce a version compatibility between an enterprise SharePoint site that you're using for collaboration and your loss in backend application. Uh, you know, if you need to apply a patch to SharePoint or you want to upgrade to a new SharePoint version, uh, that means um, being tied to what's supported in your uh, loss in, you know, your, your loss in release schedule and potentially having to do a loss in update uh, to, to keep uh, SharePoint updated across the board. What kind of specs am I looking at for these uh, for these uh, servers for Mingle? I mean, this is just a soft client that's being supported by these, right? Um, yeah. So for for Mingle servers, um, so a quick disclaimer that um, that hardware sizing uh, really is is the responsibility of the software vendor. Um, I would uh, I will defer to Infor on their recommendations, but as a rule of thumb, I'd recommend. Uh, Windows VM size with uh, four CPUs and eight gigabytes of RAM uh, to to run Mingle. I think I think that's a solid uh, a solid base. It is uh, I, that might seem like a lot of memory, but um, you know SharePoint is uh, definitely a, a memory hog. All right. What um, a couple other a uh, couple other Mingle differences from. Uh, that make it a little bit different than Lawson 9. Um, in Lawson 9, you uh, might have your LBI dashboards as your portal homepage, uh, where uh, the, the dashboard displays 
you're in the middle portion of portal, you still have your bookmarks on the left, you still have your search uh, in the upper right. Um, with loss in 10, uh, it doesn't, doesn't quite work that way. LBI, uh, uh, LBI lives in its own Mingle plugin, which means at the top of your Mingle screen, you'll have an icon for portal, and you'll have an icon for LBI, and, and that content doesn't really uh, coexist on the same page together. Although, um, the good news is you can still do links to, uh, to, to portal screens from an LBI dashboard. Um, you know, you, you can still bring in all the same content from Portal into an LBI dashboard that um, that that you that you had the ability to do in version nine. Um, I do want to point out point out that even though our user interface for Lost Intent is called Mingle, uh, Portal still exists. Portal still is a key component of the Lost in system, uh, and Portal.jar still installs on the uh, Lost in server that installs into the WebSphere instance there. Uh, also with Mingle, um, our, uh, the welcome message that used to be in the upper right, uh, that goes away, uh, it doesn't, doesn't really exist in Mingle. Um, a lot of people used that area to display the current product line. Um, you know, if you're in a test environment that has several product lines, uh, handy to see that. Uh, it, with Loss in 10, there's functionality to display the product line name right after the token name, so uh, it's more prominently displayed on the center of the screen, right next to the, uh, the screen code, it'll say the product line name. A um, couple, uh, couple other cool things with uh, Mingle. Um, out of the box, uh, the Mingle homepage um, is, is basically a SharePoint page, uh, which, is, which is cool because it allows you to take advantage of all the widgets and, and capabilities available in SharePoint. You can put some announcements up there, or a document library with help information, uh, you know, all, all the things that you can do in SharePoint, um, you have that native functionality. But uh, if you'd rather not have your users go through one extra click uh, to go from the, the default Mingle homepage to get into, you know, the, the portal screens, um, you can publish direct links to S3 or LBI or and any other component that's shown uh, in Mingle. Um, so if you have that link on like the intranet site or, 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 or what have you, um, you can get, get people to the right place, uh, save an extra click. Um, I talked a little bit about the custom plugin and uh, in, in my Mingle components uh, slide. Um, the custom plugin uh, basically allows you to publish any uh, in for loss and web interface into Mingle and add an icon right at the top of the screen uh, for that. So a couple of things that I found really useful to use a custom plugin for, uh, one is RQC, right? Because how do you normally get to RQC is you navigate in the portal, open up your uh, 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 you know requisition center bookmarks and click on shopping, that pops up a new page. Um, Publishing that with a custom plugin saves a couple of clicks, uh, makes it a little bit more prominently displayed at the top of the screen. Uh, and the same goes with the web-based in-basket for approvals. Uh, I like to use a custom plugin to set up an icon for my in-basket, again, to save having to navigate through the bookmarks. Now, the nice thing about the custom plugins, or really any uh, of the Mingle plugins, is that they can be secured by loss and roles. Uh, so you can set for each plugin um, what role membership do users need in order to see that. So, uh, for example, if I'm publishing RQC with a custom plugin, I might attach that to my RQ requester role. Uh, so users that are that that are not granted access to be a requester, they don't see that link. And the same goes with InBasket. Uh, I might uh, associate my uh, InBasket plugin with the in-basket user ST role, uh, at my, uh, my actor role for access into that. So if I don't have rights to be an approver, I'm not presented with the icon to try and get into that screen. I had a question. Can a client configure the landing page after logging into Mingle? For example, a user logs in and lands on an LBI dashboard. Um, you would just you uh, the user would have to 
sort of preemptively go to that lens, I think is, is the answer. Um, right? Yeah. I yeah. think you have to go through the plugin. Yeah. So if you were just typing in the, you know, if you go open your browser and just typed in the name of your Mingle server, um, no, that's going to take you to the default Mingle homepage. They would have to specifically uh, navigate to that LBI link. If they're not already authenticated, they'll be prompted for a login, and then, then, they'll, then they'll be at where they need to go. Cool. Um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about ESS. Um, so in the loss and 10 world, um, you know, portal is presented through Mingle. That's a, that's a requirement for, for loss and 10. It's the only supported access of portal is uh, through the Mingle framework. Um, ESS, however, it, it's optional. Um, you, can, you can navigate to ESS screens through Mingle. Uh, you can also access ESS standalone. Uh, you know, that's, that's a supported way to access ESS. It's sort of outside of the whole uh, Mingle framework. Um, of course, ESS doesn't have a navigation system on its own. Uh, it relies on portal bookmarks to, to navigate through the various pages on ESS. So if you're, if you're looking to set up access to ESS uh, more of a stand, on a standalone basis, um, one easy way to facilitate that is to just create a static HTML page, like a custom HTML page um, that provides a, a menu to the screens that you want your user, your employees to be able to access uh, in ESS. And one reason you might do that is because you want to make ESS available uh, to the internet at, at large, uh, allow people to um, you know, maybe do an open enrollment accessing uh, ESS from home. And um, for security reasons, uh, you might want to re uh, sort of reduce the uh, infrastructure that's presented out to the internet. You don't want to make SharePoint, Mingle, Portal, uh, uh, you know, all these loss and components available outside the firewall to sort of narrow down the, the potential um, vector for outside access. So uh, we. That's definitely um, a technique that, that we would recommend, and, um, and, and that can be done by creating, basically just creating your own menu, menu page for ESS. Uh, so th this has been a, a, a pretty popular request um, over the past couple of years to make ESS available uh, outside the firewall, and uh, Infor has responded with some New, uh, new capabilities, new functionality to, to help with that. Um, it's available in the um, uh, recent versions of ESS um, as well as uh, recent versions of ISS working in conjunction if you have ISS in for security services uh, deployed along with ESS. Um, it, you've got some new capabilities for endpoint based security rules. What that means is if I have two endpoints on my Lawson system, I have an internal web server and an external web server, I can set up some extra security rules that only apply if the user is accessing Lawson through the external web server. Um, so I can say if somebody's coming into Lawson uh, on the external side, maybe that person is a, uh, is, works in finance and has access to uh, GL tables and GL screens. But maybe I don't want to provide that access over the internet. I can set up a security role that locks uh, access down specifically to the, the tables and programs needed for ESS. Uh, and and um, even though that user account is typic, uh, you know, still maintains access to the GL when they come into loss in, on the internal side, uh, if they were to get in um, from a browser from home, um, they would be blocked from, from accessing those parts of us. Just as an extra security precaution. Uh, okay, enough about ESS. Uh, let's, talk a, let's talk a little bit about process flow to IPF. Yeah, I got half an hour. <laughs> um, I'm actually doing the next presentation, so I will just keep going. <laughs> um, so uh, you, I, I'm sure you've heard by now that um, 
you know, process flow ends with loss in nine. The next generation workflow product is called Infor Process Automation. Um, and it's, it's pretty, it, it is a, uh, it's a great update over process flow. Uh, there are just so, so many aspects of IPA that I, I think are superior. Um, it, I've, been, I've been hyping it for uh, a couple of years now. Uh, of course, IPA runs under the uh, landmark application server um, platform. So um, if, if you're running process flow today, uh, definitely um, landmark becomes a, uh, a key part of your, of your loss intent infrastructure. Um, for the past couple of years, uh, you know, we've been telling you um, Hey, get ready for loss in 10 by, um, by, by working on your process flow to IPA migration uh, while you're still on loss in 9. Sort of break off that chunk of work. Uh, get comfortable and familiar uh, with the new system. And that will just ease your transition into loss in 10. Um, at, that, at this point, um, I, you know, that's, I, whilst before I think it was more of a given, uh, uh, there was a, a clear benefit of moving to IPA in advance. Um, at this point in the calendar, a lot of you are looking to go live on loss in 10 uh, in under a year. Um, it, it's, uh, it's more of a, a pros and cons decision of do you want to tackle that in the nine environment or do you want to go to 10? Um, I will, I will uh, talk a little bit about upgrade approach um, a few slides from now, but just, um, just as a preview, the loss in 10 upgrade is a parallel upgrade, which means building out a uh, new infrastructure, building out a new environment, and doing a cutover. If you're adding Landmark into your loss in 9 environment, um, you're probably going to duplicate that, that build effort uh, on the 10 side um, because you wouldn't want to steal your Landmark servers out of your 9 environment uh, during the upgrade window. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, send me an email and I'll try and clarify. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll also just point out that Land, there are two different operating systems that Landmark is supported on, uh, Windows and AIX. So regardless of your uh, the, the operating system that Lawson is running on, uh, you have to use either AIX or uh, Windows for your, for your Landmark. Uh, Landmark and Java go together like peanut butter and jelly, uh, where, where LSF was the runtime environment for COBOL-based applications. Uh, it's analogous over on the Landmark side. Landmark is the runtime environment for Java-based applications. And the current version of Landmark uh, 10.1.1.26 is built on a Java 7 foundation. And you must be running Java 7 across the board uh, in order to, uh, to use import process automation with workflow triggers. So if you were looking to implement Landmark in your loss in 9 environment, uh, this is very important because if your LSF server is running WebSphere 7, your LSF server is running Java 6, uh, you cannot go to the latest version of Landmark. There is, a, there is a version of Landmark that, that will run on Java 6, and that's version 10.1.0, uh, but, but that, is, that is currently out of support. Uh, that's, that's no longer in mainstream maintenance uh, by um, IPA considerations, uh, I, could, I could talk about this for half an hour, instead I'll try and keep it to 30 seconds. There is uh, just so much to, that, that, this is exactly why we've been talking about doing this as a separate project uh, for the past couple of years. Um, there's a lot to think about when moving from a process flow to IPA. In addition to just converting over the flows, uh, which turns out to be one of the easier parts of the, um, of the upgrade, you've got to migrate over uh, any uh, prover data, data you have. For example, if you're using um, uh, tasks and categories to store your approvers, and that data currently uh, exists in, in the WF tables in the Logan product line. Under IPA, that's, that's stored in a different repository. 
uh, the, you know, that data is stored over in the landmark IPA database. The table schema is, is not, not quite the same. There is a, uh, an import-export utility that Infor provides in order to move that data across. Of course, if you have any, um, any crystal reports uh, or, or any custom reporting out there that maybe shows, hey, here are all the requisitions that are currently in the approval process. Here's who they're waiting for and how long they've been waiting. Uh, or I have a report that shows me my approver matrix with uh, levels along the top and departments uh, on, on the side. Uh, all, all, those, uh, cus all that custom reporting needs to be redeveloped for IPA because the, uh, the table schema is, is, uh, is slightly different. Um, um, training is a, is a big part of the, the migration. Um, we recommend two different tracks of training. One is Landmark Administration. Uh, Landmark is on par with LSF as far as complexity. Uh, so you need to understand uh, how to maintain it, how to patch it, how to troubleshoot it, how to find the log files, um, uh, uh, all your typical, uh, understand security, uh, all the typical um, maintenance that you would do over on the LSF side. And then on the developer side, uh, there's so much new stuff in IPA that um, you, you really want to you really want to take advantage of it. So I, I definitely recommend an IPA refresher course, even for an experienced process flow developer, uh, because you, you want to learn about all the new features and um, and ways to improve your flows, your both your existing flows and, and any new flows you might develop going forward. Um, and uh, the final point I'll cover is a cutover strategy um, from process flow to IPA. This is particularly important if you're implementing Landmark in your nine environment. Um, in, if, if you're doing the IPA conversion as part of the 10 upgrade, you already have a, a significant uh, cutover plan for Go Live Weekend. Uh, work units just becomes one piece of that. But when, um, when moving from, uh, from process flow to Landmark in a nine environment, uh, one thing to keep in mind is uh, at the moment that you cut over workflow triggers from process flow to IPA, uh, that means that any new um, flows that are kicked off, instead of being kicked off in process flow, so for example, I'm releasing a requisition or I'm releasing a, a personnel action, instead of generating a work unit in process flow, I'm going to do a cutover so uh, that work unit is generated over on the landmark side in the IPA. However, when you do that cutover, that does not affect any live work units you have running in process flow at the time. So if I have requisitions out for approval, uh, cutting over my workflow trigger to IPA actually does not just move the uh, those move those live work units over over to IPA. So um, you've got generally two choices. One is you can run out process flow, basically uh, run dual workflow systems for a week or two, however long it takes to clear out uh, everything that was waiting for approval over in the old system. Uh, or you can, um, you can, you can uh, terminate all those work units on the process flow side and um, start new ones over on the IPA side. And, and that can be done basically by querying uh, you know, WF working units, table, see what's in process, and uh, use a simple script or, um, or upload to, um, to create new work units on the IPA side. Yeah. I do have one question. Is, so is it about IPI? It's back to the job. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. So are you saying that the LSF back office Java version must match the landmark Java version, even if they're on different servers? Um, that is exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. So why? Why? Next question. Yeah. Great question. So. Um, there is some interaction between uh, between your 4GL code and your uh, Java-based process flow, your BPM component in Lawson. Um, and in order to get uh, work units to trigger over in IPA, which is on a totally different server, um, it, as part of the process of installing Landmark in IPA is you take some uh, 
you update BPM on the LSF side uh, with some new jar files that you copy over from Lambda. And those jar files get added to the, your LSF class path uh, on, on the loss and serve. And if you bring those jar files over from your landmark 10.1.1 server, they're all compiled for JDK 7. They won't run on JDK 6. So simply by having that jar file in your class path over on the LSF side, the VPM won't start at all. So that's that's where the, the requirement comes in. Now I will say if you don't if, if you are not interested in triggering a work unit from 4GL based code, then you don't have to worry about that. If you want to run if if you want to run flows only based on a schedule or based on incoming file interface with uh, what used to be called uh, BCI now called channels, uh, you don't have to set up workflow triggers. And you can run, uh, you can basically run a standalone instance of IPA that's uh, not integrated at that level, and then, then there's no there's no Java interoperability at that point. Hey, I got another great question for you. Yeah. Would an approver see two in baskets or one when you bring up IPA, and there's still in-flight work units in PFI? Yes, totally would. Um, so. You totally would, and that would be that would actually be under bookmarks. So you would have the old bookmark as well as the new bookmark. That is super confusing. So how how to get around that? If um, if if the approver base, if they're used to going into portal and navigating through the bookmarks to access their in basket, that's going to be really hard for them to juggle between two different in baskets. However, if they're, to, if they're used to receiving an email notification from the flow that says, hey, you've got something to approve, click here to approve that item, well, that makes it a little bit easier because in your email notifications coming out of IPA, they can provide the link to the IPA in basket. And your email notifications coming out of process flow will provide the link to the process flow in basket. Uh, so that just if they're if they're not using portal bookmarks as their method of navigation, uh, then it's it's not as complicated to manage those two different baskets. Right. Let's talk about ISS. Um, this is Carl's favorite subject, but I won't. <laughs> um, ISS is a uh, it, it's a it, a relatively new product for Infor. Uh, it's a it's a it's an interesting product to say the least. Uh, its main purpose uh, that we that we use it for is the the method of federation between LSF and Landmark. Um, while where other loss and applications like LBI, uh, MSCM, uh, Smart Office do single sign on back to loss. Landmark is its own application server and basically uh, manages its own security. It has its own repository of, of users and, and, and roles. So in order to keep that synchronized between uh, all of your security setup on the LSF side and all of your security setup on the Landmark side, uh, ISS bridges that gap and provides the federation. Um, that's not the only thing ISS can do. ISS has some cool reporting features uh, built into it, real-time monitoring. Um, it also provides a web-based interface to maintain uh, loss in user accounts. So where, uh, you know, uh, in the pre-ISS world, if you want to create a new user, change roles assigned to a user, you're going to use that loss in security administrator or desktop tool. ISS provides, makes, uh, provides a nice web uh, replacement uh, interface for, for the LSA desktop. But implementing ISS uh, is um, um, definitely, I would just say, don't underestimate the, um, the importance and complexity of planning uh, for your ISS implementation. Uh, at the uh, Infor Winter Showcase this year, Andy Hammerschmidt uh, called out ISS, particularly the ISS sync, as, um, as, as one of the um, yeah, yeah. One of the uh, one of the one of the the um, 
I guess maybe you call it gotcha, right? I don't know if it's that word. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. Um, uh, the, um, so what can you do to help make this ISS implementation go a little bit easier? Um, uh, basically, um, the cleaner your LDAP data is, the, the, the better the ISS uh, sync is going to go. It's, it's going to, when LSF and Landmark tie together, um, the, the, the higher quality of data you have in LDAP is definitely key. So we recommend um, reviewing it beforehand, do a dump of all the LDAP data, and, um, and look for anomalies, look for errors, and try to correct that in advance. Make sure that your LDAP schema is, is up to date. Um, that the LDAP, there have been LDAP schema updates as uh, requirements in core technology updates in the past. But uh, we have discovered that uh, for one reason or another, oftentimes the schema update is just missed, forgotten, skipped, what have you, um, and, and uh, needs to be brought up to the latest version. Um, also, um, you, uh, the, the ISS changes the way that user, users are provisioned. Uh, keep in mind, your, uh, if you have a different group that provisions loss and users, maybe uh, an IT security group that's different from the loss and admin group, keep them involved uh, in the ISS impl uh, implementation. Make sure they get the training they need. Um, be on, uh, if, if not the latest um, environment service pack, you want to be uh, N minus 1 or N minus 2 with patches. And do that in advance and make sure the environment's stabilized um, uh, prior to going into the, into the ISS itself. So, Let's talk a little bit about that N minus 1, N minus 2. Um, go ahead. So uh, question one, how is this different? Go ahead. How is this different if you are using ADFS? Yeah, how is it? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to phone a friend on that one. <laughs> how, um, how, how is it different if you're using ADFS? As far as ISS? Yeah. Uh, not much. Wait, as far as ISS? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it affects ISS at all because the tool is still going to be there. If, if you're in a federated environment, you have to use ISS for user provisioning. So you support a tool. So it still functions the same. So I have a, 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 another question is, what if we are already federated with Landmark? Is it still difficult? So I think, I think we're talking to clients that are federated pre ISS potentially here. Yeah. That's what we're looking at. Yeah. And so what's that migration going to be like? I mean, I, I, I think the first thing is to establish that ISS is the path forward for syncing these two environments. Right. And then what does that look like for that type of scenario? I would say that the sync potentially uh, could be more challenging in that case because if you uh, federate, um, they, they used to call it coupling, uh, where you, you would tie the, secur tie the security <laughs> together. Um, Use a you uh, but use the SSOP v2 um, service, but there wasn't a great method to keep security in sync uh, between the two systems. So there's a good chance that your landmark gen actors uh, and your uh, the loss in uh, user accounts in LDAP have some differences. You might. Uh, and the ISS sync is going to bring that up, and you're you're going to have to resolve those differences one at a time, basically, to get get the sync completed. Uh, anything you can do in advance to try and clean that up, I would recommend. So so you know, um, try and try and dump that data out of both sides, and and do maybe a manual matchup and see if you can do some corrections. Uh, If you have ADFS, do you still need to sign into Lawson, or will your credentials be passed from the network? Um, that's that's actually Kerberos that will provide that uh, feature. With ADFS, right? With ADFS, you still need to enter a username and password to log in to Lawson. Um, with Kerberos, if you access Lawson with Internet Explorer. 
uh, you have basically be logged in automatically. Whoever's logged in their Windows, uh, those credentials pass through uh, because Kerberos is the authentication mechanism of uh, Windows. All right. Um, yeah, we only have like mm, 32 slides left, so we're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just talking a little bit about release strategy. Um, uh, this is um, sort of the, the new direction of, of Infor. Uh, um, they've standardized their, their uh, release strategy. Um, they only supply new environment patches for N minus two versions. So what does that mean is, uh, let's say you're on 901, right? And uh, the current version of, of uh, 901 environment is 901. 14. If there is a uh, an issue, if you have an issue in your system, and it re it's fixed by a patch, either a patch that already exists or uh, a new patch needs to come out, maybe uh, compatibility with uh, a Microsoft Windows update that was released, or or uh, you know something of that nature. Um, Infor is only going to supply environment patches going down two versions prior to the current. So that's 901.14, 901.13, and 901.12. If you're on 901.10, uh, you won't be able to uh, get access to that patch. You will need to update uh, into uh, within two versions of current. That's um, now that only really applies on the environment side, on the technology side, because the applications are delivered as source code. So uh, patches like CTPs to that to the application because they patch the source. Um, they are uh, 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 more more widely available across versions. So, uh, Infor is standardized to a, a twice yearly uh, release for ESPs and MSPs. They come out uh, as a pair uh, once in the spring, once in the fall. Uh, however, um, other components such as uh, I, uh, ISS or you know, RPC, ESS. Uh, LSM patches, uh, they're released much more often. They're often uh, dependencies. And um, where LSF is updated by uh, installing a patch, ISS is basically patched by just replacing it altogether. So ISS is patched by redelivering. All right, let's talk a little bit about upgrade strategy. Um, what order should it go? You've got your LAUA to loss and security. You've got your process flow to IPA. Um, does it make sense to do those one at a time or put it all together? Um, you know, for for a long time we've been saying, hey, um, break this down into manageable small projects. Focus on one at a time. Um, I think uh, now with the the um, limited amount of time before May 2016. Um, definitely uh, more of a discussion, more pros and cons of, of which route you want to go. The nice thing about the LAUA to loss and security is if you tackle that in your nine environment, uh, you can do it gradually. You can move users on an individual basis uh, from LAUA to loss and security. You often do a big bang. Um, how about the uh, what's what's the what's the overall approach? for uh, the upgrade to loss in 10. Um, technically, there is an in-place option and a parallel option. Uh, of course, an in-place upgrade means applying updates to an existing environment uh, to bring it up to a certain level. And where a parallel upgrade means building out a fresh environment on the side, doing a data migration and a cover. Uh, while there both of these options are supported by Infor. Our understanding is of the, um, you know, 85 plus upgrades to 10 that have already gone live. Uh, exactly zero of them have been in place. Uh, all the rest have been parallel. So uh, here we we typically like to run with the path um, and, and go the, with the tried and true methodology. Uh, so we're, we would firmly recommend. Parallel upgrade to loss of 10. There are just so many components that need to change. There's so much that you want to test before going live. Uh, I think that in place just scenario just doesn't make a lot of sense for this jump. So, 
what's a parallel upgrade approach really look like? Well, the answer is that that really depends a lot from, uh, on your on your environment, on your uh, goals uh, for moving to ten. How would you like your environment to look different or the same? Do, you know, what works for you now in loss in nine? What would you like to change or improve upon uh, going to loss in ten? Do you want to do a, uh, production first or or test first? Um, you know, I, I can I could talk through what are the pros and the cons of each method. Uh, every upgrade is unique, but in this, I, I'd like to just talk through one method, a method that's worked well for us in the past, uh, and this is for a customer who has two environments, a test environment and a production environment. And uh, in this scenario, we're doing a three-pass upgrade. Uh, what that means is we would start by building out a uh, loss in 10 environment. Here we're starting with our test environment first. Uh, so we build out a fresh loss in 10 environment and then we're going to do a data migration to bring over a either prod or a recent copy of prod uh, to populate this loss in 10 uh, test environment. Uh, that's our first pass. We're focused on identifying all the different pieces that need to move, uh, to, to, to move over. And uh, we're opening up this environment for application exploration as well as to become a development space um, so we can work on uh, getting our customizations migrated over, um, uh, making any changes to our custom programs uh, for compatibility with version 10, doing interface testing, um, you know, making any inter interface tweaks. Um, Whilst our development activity is going on, we, uh, we're building out our second loss in 10 environment. So in this case, our second environment becomes prod. Uh, we take all the lessons learned from the 10 build patches uh, that were identified in initial testing, incorporate that all into our 10 prod build. Um, so we have a, 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 a pristine environment. Uh, and then we'll populate that with data uh, again, either from 9prod or a recent copy of, of 9prod. Um, and this time, our, uh, this is the second time we're doing our, our upgrade pass. Um, so where, where the first was focused on identifying uh, what all the pieces that, and, and procedures um, that, that become part of that upgrade pass, the second is in, uh, focused more on, uh, on timing making sure that uh, everything can be done within our projected uh, downtime window. Uh, and, and really uh, taking it as a dry run or trial, uh, trial build out. Um, our, whilst our data uh, came from loss in nine, our custom code is promoted from our future test environment to our future prod environment uh, following our uh, our typical change control uh, process. Even though it's not a live environment, we want to follow change control to make sure that we keep the environment clean and, um, and we have full documentation on everything that gets deployed. And then um, finally, our third pass is our actual go live upgrade. And uh, if you attended our cloud webinar earlier today, uh, we really dove into some details on what that, that is. Uh, and in fact, I think I have a slide about that. Let's just um, spend a couple of minutes talking about what an upgrade pass really is. Uh, of course, the biggest uh, cog or, or gear here in our in our upgrade pass machine is, is our application data, our prod product line. This is all of your transactional data with Lawson, and um, you know uh, upgrading this to ten involves bringing it into the 10 environment, running the loss and upgrade programs. By the way, um, if you've had uh, bad experiences in the past with the amount of time that the uh, in-for delivered upgrade programs take, uh, we're happy to report that um, they, they run much faster uh, with 10 and for sort of change the way that those work. Uh, they're not pure COBOL anymore. Um, they rely on Perl scripts and direct uh, database updates to sort of expedite the upgrade. Um, but in addition to the uh, application piece, the prod product line, 
there are a lot of other uh, parts that, that, that sort of make up our go live um, checklist. And um, for example, on the technology side, we've got our um, Jen and, 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 and Logan product lines. Uh, Jen, of course, is going to contain all our job definitions, scheduled job, that sort of thing. We have security, uh, our users list, uh, you know, uh, roles and classes. Um, there are uh, uh, print files or, or any other alpha files that might need to be migrated. If you've got LBI, uh, look at migrating over your uh, EF, uh, your, your, you know, your dashboard, your EFS database, your uh, report history um, and, and, and published crystal reports, your RS uh, database and, and, um, and loss and documents directory, uh, as well as the smart notes. Uh, and then um, there's uh, working in history and uh, configuration. We've already deployed uh, IPI in lots of time, looking to keep that uh, moving forward in time. Anything else about upgrade analysis? Um, let's touch on uh, platform migrations a little bit, and then we're um, going to close it down for, uh, for some final Q&A just in time. Um, just a, a, a couple of considerations, uh, you know, we have, um, I mentioned earlier that, that uh, Windows Server, uh, for us, we're hearing a lot of interest in that. In fact, we are doing some projects um, where uh, our customers are migrating from uh, Unix or Oracle or, or iSeries uh, onto the Windows platform, either on premise or uh, through an Upgrade X program. Because, of course, anybody who's moving to Infor Cloud, that also means moving to the Microsoft technology stack. Uh, so just some additional considerations if you're looking to move from one platform to another. Um, and I would say there, there's sort of two parts to that. And one part is the database. So if you're moving from Oracle to SQL Server or DB2 to SQL Server, um, there, uh, that database conversion becomes a part of every single upgrade pass, right? Um, because in, in, where if you're staying on the same database server, uh, your biggest concern is upgrading your product line data from 9 to 10. Um, if you're moving database servers, you still have to upgrade the product line data, but you also have to do a database server conversion uh, to move that database from Oracle to SQL Server. Um, generally, two approaches to that. One is, uh, what's it called, the DB copy? Yeah, loss and utility. Yeah. yeah, so there's a loss and utility you can use to move data uh, from one product line to another, even if those product lines are backed by two different database servers. Um, so you can you can use DB copy uh, to do that database conversion uh, and position you for the running the upgrade programs to test. Uh, however, uh, DB copy uh, is not always the fastest method, and if you have a large database, uh, you might find that uh, between the DB copy process and then the upgrade program process. Uh, you're not going to be able to get everything done in the, in the window that you want to take uh, for a go-live. So uh, another way to do, another approach is to, to break out the database conversion as a separate task from the, uh, from the loss and upgrade and basically use non-lossing tools to do that. For example, uh, SQL Server migration assessment, right? So there's a, a utility provided with SQL Server uh, to help with uh, migrating in from a, a different database platform. Um, so that's the database side. The other half of that equation is the environment, right? So maybe maybe you're switching from Unix to Windows, but you are staying on Oracle. Maybe you're Oracle Unix now, and you're looking at implementing Oracle Windows. Taking the database conversion out of the factor, but you still have um, the environment migration. And uh, the biggest concern there is your um, custom programs, interfaces, shell scripts, uh, anything that interacts with the operating system that's going to be really different between Unix and Windows. Um, there is some level of use compatibility on Windows for Lawson, but it is not there. Uh, it is not um, totally equivalent, equivalent to Unix. And uh, in our experience, uh, we, shell scripts don't uh, convert uh, or don't just run without um, some sort of modification or, or mitigation for Windows compatibility. 
the user ID is also a big issue. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe you should tell the group about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Thanks for letting me join. Um, so on a, on a Unix platform, you, all your batch users have an identity um, with a Unix user ID. Um, when you go to Windows, you have to have it on a Windows domain user ID. And it also converts that to a, a different number. It's called an NT ID. Um, so no matter what you do, all your uh, batch user IDs are going to change. So that's stored in your gen data. That's uh, in your job definitions, your print manager. Uh, even in your application data, it stores the user ID for update date and things like that. Oh, yeah. So even your audit history, right. you might need a crosswalk. Right. Uh, most customers choose not to do that. They just keep a, because the Unix ID is pretty easy to tra translate. Um, so they just keep it as it is, but it might be an option. Okay. Nice. Um, all right, so just a couple more things to say here. I do want to emphasize testing um, as part of this upgrade, not just application testing, uh, not just your standard um, technology testing, but other things to keep in mind. Take a look at your uh, desktop configuration out there, workstations. Um, if you, if you uh, don't try to run Lost in 10 on Windows XP, even Mingle. Don't try to go to Mingle on Windows XP. It does not work that well. Um, uh, customizations, of course, interfaces are very important to test, uh, as well as application differences. And uh, finally, I will just touch on uh, training, which, is be, which has become a part of every one of our loss and upgrades. Um, on the uh, functional side, the application side, uh, we don't see, but we haven't found a need for extensive uh, differences training because really the, the, the 10 applications are uh, fairly close to, to what they were in 901. Uh, of course, on the technology side, there are a lot of differences. So we're talking uh, LSF 9 to LSF 10 differences. If you're bringing Landmark in, uh, you know, there's Landmark administration. If you're moving to process automation, we definitely recommend uh, developer training for process IPA differences. And then, of course, security. Uh, if you're, of course, if you're just implementing loss and security for the first time, that's pretty different than LAUI. But even if you've been on Lost and Free for all, there are differences in, in the way uh, the, the underlying systems work, and we're bringing ISS in. Um, and uh, finally, uh, Mingle um, SharePoint. The good news there is, um, is you don't need a lot of SharePoint knowledge uh, to, to be able to maintain Mingle. It's basically uh, once you set it up, and, and it's, it's, you only need to go in there for updates. There's not a lot of uh, daily maintenance that needs to happen on that side. And with that, yeah. So let's keep it open here a couple of minutes. I, I know we've gone over, but certainly we have a, we have our uh, steam panel here, welcoming any questions you might have as you uh, uh, plan or are undertaking your 10x upgrades. Do do do. <laughs> Do you have any plans after this presentation? Oh, <laughs> that's a that's a great question. It is it is Friday. It is happy hour. Um, but before we before we close down for the day, um, in about 20 minutes, Keith and I are gonna are gonna do our most exciting presentation of the day. This is gonna be the most fun. Uh, we're gonna talk about what's coming up next. The uh, in in the info world, we're gonna talk about XI. Yes, we are, and uh, and you're going to be the brains, and I'm going to be the bombast. But before that, we got a question here. It's uh, it's a great question, actually. Um, it's it's about what is the typical time frame for going to version nine uh, to going to version ten, and you know, one of the things we struggle with is trying to set realistic expectations. You know, I would say that uh, it's very dependent on organization, uh, number of environments, uh, you know, whether landmarks involved or not. I mean, those are huge factors, but Realistically, we try to say, you know, it's going to be 20 to 24 weeks, sort of the baseline. And if you were, if you had a very simple set of single suite, no customs, it could happen a lot faster, and you were very organized about all that stuff. Um, but certainly, we've seen it belong. We've seen the upgrades take, you know, nine months a year. You know, I don't, I don't know if you guys want to add some of that. You know. As far as the, what are the dependencies on that that timeline? Obviously, um, 
you've got the time it takes to build out these loss and tenant environments and run through all the technical tasks. Um, but also, there's testing. And that's going to involve a, a pretty broad portion of the user community. So you have to look at um, scheduling your upgrade timeline around when your super users can be available to participate in testing. Obviously, not a lot of upgrades that are going live in December. Uh, you know, or that want to go live. <laughs> or the, right, or that want to go live in December. Uh, and then the other uh, factor is um, any uh, the, the amount of custom development or, or effort, the effort spent on custom development, either bringing in uh, customizations, how, how customized is your loss environment, uh, and as well as interfaces. Um, I'd, I'd like to touch on that for a second because this is this is one of the questions we get a lot during the during the upgrade process. And so far, we have found that the process flows migrate to IPA very easily, and and pretty much all the all the COBOL that's out there has migrated. The, the application doesn't really change that much. And in fact, when when we've had additional effort uh, related to customizations. It's just been because there's been opportunities for improvement. It either wasn't needed or there were things that hard coded that could be improved that the customer took advantage of. So, so from uh, I'm moving from nine to ten. I just wanted to dispel this notion that I'm going to have to. The customizations are not going to be usually not going to be a huge deal, right. and you're going to be able to migrate them over. And 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 so far we found that to not be a major trouble spot. Now, of course, you never know if you're hitting on the exact two tables that are going to change. But even then, it's uh. It's yeah. going to take a little bit more time, but it's not going to totally impair your right. Impair your yeah, it's yeah. Don't um, don't be intimidated by that effort. I guess yeah. what I'm just trying to get at is it that that's a factor that really varies from client to client. So uh, where where I can easily estimate the amount of time it takes to build a loss and environment based on the the you know if you let me know what products you have, it's harder for me to estimate uh, how long what's the appropriate amount of time to spend. On interface testing, what's the appropriate amount of time to spend on uh, mitigating any? But but but, but and, and but I, I guess to me, what I usually see is this pressure for let's get this done quickly and just budget at least six months. You know, yeah. And and uh, six to nine months, you're, you're gonna be you're gonna be okay. Um. So and what, and, and what about lead time? Right. Uh, it would because, make sense. Um, for starting an upgrade project, if you're um, yeah, so the market's busy right now, and uh, and it's and it's and it's hard to get a consultant to start tomorrow. So I would I would say, you know, identify your partner and start working with them you know, right away. You know, one of the things that happens in this market is that there are a lot of people that go and explore their options. That's totally fine. So like at any given time, you know, we're working on a bunch of upgrades. We also have a bunch of of, of, of open SOWs, and when those come in all in a row, it gets hard to assign resources immediately. So I just I would have realistic expectations. Um, we're super busy. Every one of our competitors is super busy. IPS is super busy. Uh, you know, just just be aware that, that that there are a lot of people upgrading right now, and uh, and uh, if, if you haven't already started, uh, you already have a resource, and you know don't already have that range. You know, there there might be some lead time in there. Yeah. If you've selected a, a partner to your upgrade, um, let them know before you plan on having them start. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's like usually can we check tomorrow? Um, so. Um, Currently, we use uh, Novell for LDAP. Okay. And we still use it for TAP. Well, okay. So you, you use Novell as your enterprise directory. You're signing in. At all users in your organization are signing in through Novell as an alternative to Windows Active Directory. Yeah, you can bind to that in, in, in Loss and Tenant. That's, that's fine. Okay. And then we have, um, you know, sort of an open question it is, is in, you know, I could take a step of this. Why is Info continuing with Java when others are moving towards HTMLS? Five. Um, so, so, so there's just sort of two layers here, you know, right? There's, yeah. There's the HTML5, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so Java is... Presentation at 4 o'clock? Yeah. <laughs> definitely. That we'll definitely touch on that. Um, you know, uh, the the server side code needs to run in something. Uh, you need a you need a business language to power these transactions. And for many many years, uh, the business language of choice was COBOL. Uh, looking at a, a an object oriented language, um, you know, for the future, uh, I think Java is a, a solid choice. Um, HTML5 does become the uh, presentation layer in Lawson 
11, um, but it's it, um, you know, it that 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 wouldn't cover all the bases as far as a a, a language for writing business logic, and so so that's where Java comes into play. And I think that just to be fair, you know, from a business perspective, uh, 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 you know, software takes a long time to develop. I mean, Landmark's been in production now eight years. That's been getting fleshed out to the point where it's right. Right, it's like, you, 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 those, those are the, those are, those are long-term sort of strategic decisions, and, and I think that you know all these companies they do the best they can with choosing choosing uh, underlying codes and languages that, that are going to last for a long time. I mean, you know, the decision to go on COBOL in the in the mid '70s is something that we're going to continue using here for another decade at least. So it's you're not that nimble and completely changing your your application. But for a front end, I think they're definitely looking at HTML5. And if that's all we got for questions, I want to thank you everyone for attending. I want to chat, thank uh, Mr. Stout. Mr. C and Mr. Cunningham, uh, who's right there beside Carl, and uh, on the camera. Uh, and uh, and uh, with that, we're going to close up. Thanks. Thank you. See you at four.